Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Black Market Leadership. I hope you can hear it in my voice. I am so, so excited to bring you this next episode. Man, of all the episodes I've done, I got to tell you, this was probably one of the most fun uh, I've done so far. It was a pleasure. So before I, I tell you who the guest is, and you probably read it, but before I go into it, I just want to tell you that I've always been interested, you know, as you know, I like military history. Well, years ago, I read a book by Victor Davis Hanson called Carnage and Culture. And in it was a chapter about Hernan Cortez fighting the Aztecs. And you read it, and you're like, oh my Lord, this is like two alien civilizations coming to meet one another. And then you read about the human sacrifices and the battle, how the Aztecs don't fight to kill, they fight to wound. Because if they capture you, they're going to sacrifice you. Then you read about the, the Spanish with their armor and their horses and their cannon. And even, uh, uh, you know, you might call them, well, kind of like their muskets, not many of them. But um, they have just a little bit of firepower and crossbows. But the point is, two alien civilizations coming together, they fight one another, and the Spanish come out uh, victorious. I read that years ago, and I was like, oh, I was just, I was entranced. It, it was, it was just amazing the story. So I picked up a book uh, via Amazon, obviously called Conquest by Hugh Thompson, and this book is 800 pages. 600 is actually just for for you, the reader. The other 200 are just notes. And in, I think, seven days, I read the whole thing. I'd come home at night. I'd probably read 70 to 80 pages a night. I could not put it down. It is the entire story to Hernan Cortez and the Spanish expedition uh, that went into Mexico, basically uh, uh, Mexico City. I read this and I was like, this is just fantastic. This is like, this is one of the best stories I think I've ever read. And then, okay, now keep keep that right there. Now, on the other, uh, on this other side over here, I have been watching a lot of Colonel Doug McGregor, as you all know, one of the past guests of uh, Black Market Leadership, especially with the Ukraine and Russia thing happening right now. And I watched, uh, it must have been a couple months ago, he had this fantastic interview with a man named Dr. Vallejos. Dr. Vallejos. And I said, you know what? I bet you Dr. Vallejos knows something about Cortez. And we, I contacted him, and he was he responded immediately, and he decided to do this interview with me. So my guest for this episode is Dr. Michael Vallejos. Now, I'm going to give you just a little bit of his background. He has done a lot of writing. He is an expert. Colonel McGregor said this guy has an encyclopedic memory, and you're going to see what he's talking about. Uh, I got some parts here for his bio, so I just want you to know who you're going to hear. Dr. Michael Vallejos uh, uh, has been a professor at the Johns Hopkins University Advanced Academic Programs. He uh, He's taught uh, strategy, global net assessment. He's been a regular guest on the John Batchelor Show. He's also been a professor of strategy at the United States Naval War College. He's the author of Finding, Fighting Identity. God, I love that identity. Fighting Identity, Sacred War and World Change, a Take No Prisoners Analysis of How War. As cultural as culture's core ritual has shaped national identity in the modern world, and Vlaos, a graduate of Yale and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, began his career in the Navy and in the CIA. Uh, he's been a senior staff member of the National Security Assessment Team of the National Security Analysis Department at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. So that's just. Uh, a, a sample of his immense background. So this interview, uh, Dr. Vallejos and I are talking about Cortez, Cortez and the Aztecs. And I got to tell you people, I was blown away. This man, he's a rock star. In my view, he is a rock star. He had, he had such amazing observations, which you're going to see. Now, saying this, you have to realize that as we're talking, I had just finished this book on Cortez. I had this knowledge now of what Cortez did, uh, the campaign, and I liked it so much. I mean, I remembered a lot about it. So he, gosh, I think he read the original um, uh, uh, text of the uh, of Cortez of the Spanish um, <laughs> of the Spanish campaign in Mexico. He read it in, in the original Spanish. So this guy, no, he, he's got an, just an enormous background background on this and strategy. So we talk about the subject as if people who, you know, at least in my case, I, I know it's a little bit. So in a sense, you're getting assessments and evaluations. Uh, in order to make this fair for you, and, and, and if you're probably not familiar, because I wasn't familiar with this at all, but in order to really, I really want to intrigue you with this. 
Before I get into this this uh, interview with Dr. Vallejos, and I want to give you an overview of the campaign. I have broke it down into it's just essential. It's very essential elements. I want to walk you through what happens, uh, some really interesting points, and with that uh, with that knowledge in your back uh, in the back of your head, then. When you hear Dr. Vallejos and I talk, I think the assessments and the evaluations will make much more sense. So with that, let's start with a little background of uh, Hernan Cortez and the conquest of the Aztec Empire. We'll start with the background, and then from there, we will go in to uh, this discussion with Dr. Vallejos. And with that, I hope you really enjoy this. And if anything, I hope I've been... I've, uh, piqued your interest in the subject and you will grab a book on Cortez and the Aztecs. I do not think at all that you will be sorry. I think you'll be very happy and utterly fascinated as I was. So with that, let's start Cortez and Chaos in Mexico with Dr. Michael Vlaos. This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. If you like what I'm about to tell you, I, I assure you this is just a fraction, a fraction of, of what's available out there. So if if we all remember our history, uh, our history courses, or I don't know what the hell you call it now, social studies, uh, in 1492, something happens in the world, and that is Columbus discovers a new world. Well, during that time, between 1492 and uh, the very early 1500s, the Spanish have really occupied the Caribbeans and Cuba. Uh, uh, they've occupied it. And in the early, let's see, 1500s, there are, there are actually two expeditions that go from Cuba to basically the, uh, the eastern coast of Mexico. Uh, one is by name, uh, and again, this really is not essential, but I just want you to understand. Uh, this one's by Cordoba. He's a man who goes, he discovers the coastline of Mexico. They think it's a bunch of islands. And obviously, they're looking at their conquistadors, they're looking for gold. Gold is really the currency right now. That's the thing that conquistadors are looking for, and that's, uh, that's what these guys need. So they go to the eastern part of uh, Mexico. Cordoba finds it, and he meets some of these weird, uh, just, just, Alien, alien cultures, uh, as well as we'll see later, the the uh, uh, connected to the the Aztecs. FYI, FYI, Aztecs are also called the Mexicans, and the Mexicans, as you will hear in this, is spelled Mexican. So when you when you read Mexican, it's actually Mexican. So sometimes Dr. Vallejos and I will go back and forth, Aztec and Mexican. It is the same thing. But he, uh, the Spanish, are introduced briefly to these this alien culture. And they notice there's human sacrifices. This is this is really you understand in, in a in a Catholic uh, in a really Catholic country like Spain, uh, that's a big. It's not just a no no. It's like the devil's here. Satan is here, and he is a, a part of this culture. So this is uh, it's intriguing. There's a lot of treasure, but there's some really evil things happening. Anyway, Cordoba goes. He finds him. He's ambushed. His army, his force gets ambushed like really bad. I think he loses like fifty percent of his force. He has to leave, goes to Florida to uh, to rest and recuperate. They get ambushed there, and they go back to Cuba. So the first one, they discover this new world, but they really didn't probe too much into it. There's another um, probe. I think the guy's in Gravella. Again, not essential, but he goes. He, again, confirms what uh, Cordoba had discovered, but he did not probe nearly as much as uh, Cordoba did. So why this is important? Cuba, which really now is a major satellite of, of Spain, knows now spain knows now that there is this new world uh and then it, it could be a section of islands a section of islands but it's not cuba and there's and there's treasure out there so ultimately ultimately her name cortez uh, i think he's gonna be age 35 people 35 years old he ultimately is going to enlist or uh, actually he gets i don't want to say he's assigned the duty or he volunteers Here's the thing. So he volunteers and he is selected to lead the next, the third expedition into uh, uh, what we now is Mexico. Now, what's interesting here, and look, there are a lot of names here, and I'm, I'm not going to throw all these names out, but the governor of Cuba uh, who assigns Cortez starts uh, at the very last minute, minute says, you know, look, we, we got Cortez going. 
people start saying, hey, you know, Cortez, I don't think he's going to be really doing what you've asked him to do. I think he's going to be doing his own show. He's a little too independent. So in essence, right before Cortez, who, by the way, is he's almost like a private vent. This is like a private venture. He has put a lot of his own money to get a crew, to get ships, to get horses, uh, to go to this new world. He is, he's actually financing this a lot of his, a lot from himself and supposedly some of the governor of Cuba is doing it as well. Anyway, just to show you, uh, just, just to give you a, an understanding of how this is going to unfold, this, this campaign, right before Cortez takes off with, with this crew, he's got ships, he's got, a, a, I, don't know, I think, a couple hundred uh, Spanish, could be totally wrong. I think, I think it's like 100 to 200. Got some horses, weapons. Right before they <laughs> ship off, the governor runs to the coast like, hey, hey, no, 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 don't go. Don't go. I don't want you to go. And Cortez, surrounded by his bodyguards, goes, sorry, sorry, can't hear you. And he drives off. So right now, you can already tell Cortez is a very independent person, and rightfully so in this case because he sponsored his own money. He, they got to go get gold. They got to get treasure because he's he's going to be out of, out of money. And other conquistadors have actually, I think, helped sponsor this too. So people, they are really, really, they got um, a real stakehold and in, in, um, uh, in success here. Anyway, Cortez goes to uh, Mexico. This is the this is in the year 1519. Okay, 1519. He leads uh uh yeah, so he, and ultimately I'm not gonna go that they discover a bunch of towns or there's a couple skirmishes, but ultimately when they go to Mexico on the eastern coast of Mexico, they discover this alien culture, these different alien um, uh tribes. And what they realize is there's a major tribe out there, the Mexicans, the Aztecs. See, the, what they learn is the Aztecs are almost like a big national power, that they are enslaving, in a sense, they're enslaving other tribes out there. And what, what Cortez realizes is that there are tribes out there that don't like their masters. And in fact, if they're going to go against their masters, there's probably a big chance that Cortez can then take from these soldiers some of their people and use them as a potential force. So ultimately, ultimately what happens is the Aztecs come in, they have spies, they see that the Spanish are here and they don't know who the Spanish are. Montezuma, the king of the Aztecs, he is in his capital called Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City. And again, Dr. Vallejos and I talk about this, but he's in a, he gets word about these, uh, about these Spanish con conquistadors, the Spanish force with their armor and their horses, which these guys think they're giant deer. They had never seen it. Montezuma is really a fatalist. He's like, oh my God, it's the Aztec gods are coming back. They're going <laughs> to, they're not happy and they're going to smack us down. So instead of really, uh, pushing back with a military force or, or really doing anything to resist them coming in they what the aztecs do is they try to uh accommodate acquiesce and please the aztecs hey hey this is from our emperor thank you don't come any further our emperor is very busy and what you find is cortez starts learning that that the aztec capital Tenochtitlan, is the nexus it is the connector of all these other um uh all these other civilization civilization satellites which are basically in servitude to the Aztecs. So Cortez starts thinking, ah, <laughs> I know I can now, we can now leverage, we can now leverage these power against this potential capital. And, and he, again, he's hearing about this capital. So anyway, Cortez makes some alliances. He gets several thousand, several thousand uh, Mexican warriors to follow them, uh, to support them. Now then these are not Mayans. Mayans are a civilization below the Aztecs. But it's some of these satellites, and again, they're so, I think it's like 20 to over 20 to 30 of these satellites. I'm not going to go into details. Just know that he gets uh, Indian allies, and they support the army. But here's the thing. The, these Mexican, these Az, uh, Aztec satellites, they don't have the firepower. They don't have the, the again, the Spanish have some guns, maybe like 10. I'm not kidding. You, a force of 200, maybe 10. But they, they have armor. They have really really sharp swords and lances they have horses armored horses so they have a really formidable force a force which literally is alien to the aztecs cortez then takes his alliance of several thousand uh, uh aztec satellites who are now friendly to the the friendly spanish and they march inward they march inward about, i think about 250 miles to the capital to Nishtobin. now this is phase one i call establishing the goal 
Cortez hears about this and he realizes, look, here I am in Mexico. I uh, He's financing this. And remember, his job, his job is to get gold. If he gets gold, he can become rich. His people, well, first, it's all about him. Second, his king can become rich. And get if you make the king rich, you get pro, you you become prominent. You you become that second man by the king. Literally, this is the, this is an opportunity to find a total lost kingdom, a potential new Spain. So Cortez is thinking about himself and about how he can bring glory onto himself. And now he's got this force. He's he's seeing some of the treasures that the Aztecs have. The Aztecs are giving them gold, this and that, all these feathers and plumes. But again, it, what what most important is the gold. They're like, my God, look at all those gold that they're giving us now. Imagine what they have at the capital. And they're hearing rumors about how rich their capital is. So they march from the uh, coast and east, basically at where, where Veracruz is in Mexico. They march westward into the uh, into the center of Mexico. This is called establishing the goal because now they realize what the goal is. And for this story, what's so fascinating is Cortes realizes he was my opportunity to potentially capture a major treasure for my king. Okay, major treasure. That is the initial aim, the initial goal. Now, he doesn't know what Tenochtitlan looks like. He just heard about it. It's supposed to be beautiful, wild with treasure. So he's establishing the goal. They march inward uh, in, into the interior. Now, this goes to phase two, arrival at the goal. So in August of 1519, Cortez and his forces come upon the territory of the Tlaxcalan. Again, you don't need to really know this, but that T-L-A-X-C-A-L-L-E and the Tlaxcalan, they are, are, are in servitude to the Aztecs, but they don't like the Aztecs. But the, 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 the Tlaxcalan don't know Cortez. This, they're an alien force in their backyard. So what happens is as Cortez and some of his allies march into this territory, they are attacked. And this force is probably 1,000, 2,000 people. Remember, I think we have roughly 200, 200 Spanish, but they have uh, uh, 1,000 or two uh, of their allies already supporting them. And it's a battle. They, they fight, and it's day and night. These guys are relentless as they attack. What they realize, though, the Spanish do, is that the, the Mexicans, they have no armor, their weapons are, believe it or not, they're very, very sharp. Uh, they're wooden. They have like uh, uh, obsidian stone. They're made to wound because when they capture you, they're going to kill you. And then uh, they're going to sacrifice you. And this is terrifying. So for in August, the there's two to three days of this bloody battle. And I mean, the uh, the Spanish are tired. They're exhausted, but they have minimal casualties. But, but... Two of the, I think, I'll say two of the 12 horsemen they have were captured and killed. And Cortes here that they were sacrificed, even the horses. Ugh. Oh, I read that like, oh my God, that's horrible. <laughs> so anyway, what, what happens is the Spanish, the Spanish become, uh, they, they, they tire out their, the Tlax column. And in fact, the Tlax column then welcome in, welcome them into the city. And now they realize the Tlax call them, okay, we can't defeat you. We're, we're, we're going to have to live with you or supposedly live with you. But what, ha what will happen is Cor uh, uh, Cortez will make a alliance with them. Now, from Tlaxcala, they move to another city called Cholula. And Cholula, I believe, is still uh, in Mexico right now. Again, this is another uh, tribe which is uh, has subservience to uh, Montezuma II and the Aztec and you know, Tenochtitlan. Uh, they uh, they welcome the Spaniards in, but what happens is the Spaniards come in and they realize that the, the, the Cholulas are going to actually ambush them the next day. Now, this is really important. This is really important here. Cortez realizes that, you know, okay, even though they left in the city, they did, they did so grudgingly and they're hiding something. They're hiding. And they realize that, that uh, I think from some of the Indian women that the Spanish are sleeping with, they tell them, hey, guess what? My brother-in-law, he's in that ditch outside. And when you guys march out, they're going to ambush you. So, so what happens is Cortez, and this is really smart. Cortez, this is really going to be almost a, a foreshadowing of how he fights, how he thinks. He is severely outnumbered. He's severely outnumbered uh, in terms of Spanish, even though he has Spanish allies. But so how do you compensate? Even though he has technological advancements, how do you compensate? You go for the head. You go for the jugular. 
So what they do is they invite all uh, in the city of Cholula, this massive city, Cholula, massive. They invite uh, like I think a hundred or two hundred of the of the elites of the city invites them to uh, uh, to come to this this one. Uh, uh, I almost say out, outside a major temple. Come here, we're going to talk. There's an announcement. So all the heads, the elites, like the congressmen, the senators, they all come there and Cortez closes the place off and, and basically says, you know what? We know what you guys are going to do and it's not going to fly. And that's when the Spanish, you probably guessed it, kill them. They massacre all the heads of basically all the major political players, cutting the head off right then and there. And when they do that, though, now that Cholula is basically decapitated, the their other Indian allies who don't like the Cholula, they go in and they pillage the hell out of the place. They destroy it, rape, kill. It, it's just a massacre. But this is really important because right now, what Cortez and and the uh, and, and the Spanish have learned to do is when they fight, you go for the juggler because that is a way to compensate for having such low numbers, and you go for the political juggler, literally the decision makers. So. That that right there is just a major major element. Uh, from this though, they again they start making more alliances. They start saying, "Hey, the other Indian, uh, the other Indian or the uh, the Mexican slash Aztec satellites realize, man, the Spanish, you can't mess with these guys. They're serious. And guess where they're going? They're going to Tenochtitlan. They could overthrow. They can overthrow our enemies, the people who have been making us." Send our people and uh, to be sacrificed, making us send our goods, our food, all the things that we need. They could overthrow our enemy. We'll use these Spaniards to do our dirty work for us. And that becomes almost in the mindset uh, of a lot of these uh, Indian allies. So ultimately, Cortez and his new Spanish allies, they, they several thousand soldiers, they then march up to Tenochtitlan. And again, uh, the the whole march itself is just fascinating because the Aztecs are watching. Montezuma's like, oh my God, I do not want these people coming. They continually send all these uh, diplomats. Hey, here's some gold. Thank you. We're so glad to see you. Unfortunately, our, our emperor Montezuma, he's too busy right now. He can't deal with you. And Cortez is like, look, we're here in peace. We want to be your friend. It's very, it's a big shame he doesn't want to meet us. I, I think that's okay. It's okay. We're going to go march anyway. And I'm sure once we get there, he'll be happy to see us. That really is what Cortez is doing. It's a very nice extroverted attempt to uh, allay people's fears, but everyone knows that this this iron juggernaut, uh, this steel juggernaut that represents the Spaniards with their thousands of Indian allies follow in, in the rear following uh, are, is coming. So in November, November 1519, Cortez and his entourage, entourage, his force, and the Indian allies enter the city of Tenochtitlan and Montezuma meets them. It's a very, very... Uh, interesting uh, meeting. And if you go, go on YouTube, there's actually excerpts of what both said to one another, but Montezuma lets them in. God, man, what what a hell of a, uh, a mistake. Letting the enemy in the gates. And basically the Spaniards are set up uh, at the top of these temples, overlooking the city. They are basically the guests of Montezuma, but the enemy is now inside the city. And by the way, when I, people, uh, Tenochtitlan, we're not talking about some village. We're talking like probably two to 300,000 people um, in the city or around it as it happens. It is a major metropolis. And when, when Cortes gets there, people, they're saying it's it's more beautiful than anything in, in Italy. They call it the Venice on the water because it's got these huge temples, these buildings. It's got water co uh, causeways like you see in Venice. Uh, people are moving up and down um, with these uh, boats it, fishing, it's the travel. It really is a huge metropolis. It is extraordinarily advanced. It, it's just beautiful. But the only thing, the the one thing that you know that the issue is, they're sacrificing people. When I and I don't mean one or two, I mean thousands. They're they're laying people out, cutting their hearts out, then cutting their limbs off. The priests eat the limbs. It's a gruesome, gruesome um, time of ritual. And for Europeans, I would say even Westerners, it's disgusting. Uh, and for the Spanish, uh, they, they think it's it's satanic. I mean, literally, when I say satanic. They're like, this this is the devil here. Who who cuts people up alive and does this stuff? But even though the Spanish think it's horrible and and, and they're really sickened by it, 
they are, they, they're careful because remember, it's also their Indian allies do the same thing. So they're, they're having to walk a tightrope in terms of relations. Okay. Now, this again, this is phase two. Cortez has arrived. He has arrived in the city. And he is actually in there. So question is, what do you do? How, how do we take the city? Look, there's there's commerce. They talk about the markets. The markets are enormous. There's people moving in and out. This would be a major, major treasure for our king, the king of Spain. How do, you know, this really is the ideal. So now that they've arrived there, this goes into phase three. And phase three, as I call defending the goal, defending the goal. Something happens. Okay. Something happens. Uh, well, actually, a couple of things happen. One is Cortez, in, in essence, kidnaps Montezuma. They take Montezuma uh, as, a, as a prisoner. They do, it, they do it lightly. But Montezuma knows that if he, if he uh, um, doesn't come along and stay with the, with the Spaniards in their temple overlooking the city, he's going to die. So Montezuma goes. So one is the, the king, the emperor well, of, this, of this kingdom. Uh, of this culture of what 20 25 million uh yeah he he's he's kidnapped right now he's staying <laughs> up with the spaniards so that's one thing and now that kind of puts the city on a very nervous edge our emperor you know is being held against his will so that's number one number two is and this is what just fascinating Cortez gets word that you remember when I told you how he left Spain and the governor's like, hey, hey, don't go, don't go. And court says, hey, see you later. Well, that uh, uh, I think the, the Spanish governor, Alvarado, he is really pissed at Cortez and he sends a man, Narvaez. He sends Narvaez with 800, 800 Spaniards to the New World to capture and arrest Cortez and take him and take him back to Cuba. So Cortez learns that his own people have now sent a force, which, by the way, is four times the size of the Spaniards. Cortez has roughly two hundred uh, Spaniards. The new force that just lands uh, near again near Veracruz, where he landed, it's four times the size, and they're there to take Cortez. So Cortez now has to take his force, I uh, say most of his force. Back to the coastline, again, roughly, what, 200, 250 miles back to face this force. So he goes eastward, goes eastward to take care, to deal with this issue. And he leaves, this is important, he leaves his top lieutenant, Alvarado, Alvarado in the city to watch over the Spaniards, the, the Spanish garrison, very small, man, they still have their Indian allies, and, and their prisoner, Montezuma II. So, Cortez goes to the uh, goes back to the coast. He finds Nar Nar uh, Narvaez. I, th I think it's how you say it, Narvaez. Long story short, Narvaez is kind of a uh, uh, he's a tyrant of a leader. He he really pisses off some of the Spaniards who have come with him. And what happens is uh, with a again Cortez being the master manipulator and being a great politician, he gets some of, uh, of Narvaez's forces to come to his side. Cortez attacks him. Great small unit tactics. He, he actually overtakes Narvaez's force on the coastline, conquers it, conquers Narv Narvaez. He actually knocks, uh, I think his soldiers poke out one of his eyes with a lance during a battle. So Narvaez got his one eye Narvaez now. It's a success. It's a, it's a, Cortez can wipe his brow like, ah, oh, everything's good now. I'm no longer, you know, this threat is gone. But now, Word comes back to Cortez. Hey, by the way, Tenochtitlan is in an uproar. Well, why? Why? Yeah, your first your lieutenant Alvarado. He just massacred a couple thousand of uh, Aztec elites in the city, like they did prior. So Cortez now has to take his force, which now augmented it, 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 all these other people from Narvaez. He's hey, come with us. You'll get the gold. There's a great city. Do they go back? And they, what they find is the city is like, it's, it's a dead city. People are indoors. No one's feeding the, um, the conquistador forces. They, they're no one's being polite because for whatever reason, Alvarado got, I think a little paranoid. And he thought that the Aztecs smelt blood in the water. Like there's an opportunity to overthrow the Spaniards. Now that the major force went to the East coast. 
Plus, they were doing something now. Now, this is conjecture. No one, no one knows the real reason, but we do know this that the Spaniards were really, really upset about the um, uh, about the human sacrifice and told the Aztecs, told Montezuma, "Hey, tell them to stop, no more." And the Aztecs are like, "Hey, this is our life. You can't be <laughs> look. We've welcomed you here. We've given you our food, our shelter. You're not going to tell us how to live." So they have this huge festival where they're sacrificing, and the Spaniards come. They close off the entrances and they kill several thousand. And when I say kill them, some of the, uh, you know, some of the descriptions, the eyewitness accounts are just imagine, uh, and it's kind of gr grotesque, but you know, you think of like buying a big piece of pork roast, take a big hatchet and slap that thing in half. You see how it splits there. There are stories about the, 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 um, uh, Spaniards coming up, the conquistadors hitting, hitting man, woman, even children, just whack right in the shoulders and they come apart knocking heads off knocking arms off just slaughtering and they're slaughtering again the politicians the high priests these this is really is the intellectual nexus the the power of politics in the city and and again alvarado thinking the way cortez does is to decapitate stop the human sacrifice to stop the potential threat anyway what happens is there becomes a riot Cortez arrives back with his force. They're now, they're now trapped inside the city. And now the Aztecs rise up and they start fighting. And boy, they're throwing spears, rocks. It's constant battling. And literally, I, if you can imagine like an old Western movie, well, I don't know, like young guns were like, you know, they're trapped in the one house in the city fighting off the police in every direction. That's what's happening. The, the Spanish are just, they're being uh, barraged. It's a barrage of this missiles swords attacks day and night day and night and it's so bad that cortez tells montezuma hey go out the go out on the balcony here you know 100 steps up go out there and tell everyone to calm down well the aztecs who usually have a real um affinity or i i would say uh, a real appeal to a, there's a real reverence for authority montezuma goes out to say, hey, slow down, stop, stop, and stop the fighting. These these people are our friends; they're our guests. And what do the Aztecs do? Like are you traitor! And they throw rocks and they hit them. And the, it's believed that it wasn't Cortez uh, who, or the Spaniards who killed Montezuma. It was the Aztecs. They were sick of them. And Montezuma gets hit in the head, I think, several times, falls down, and he's dead. That means a new that the emperor, the emperor who who was running the show earlier, who actually was almost the um, the element that was calming people down, was quelling the potential violence against the Spaniards. He's gone. So now the Spaniards are really they fight for their lives. They have no more advocate or champion on their side. And what happens is again, this is just amazing. You got to read this. This is street to street fighting. Cortez has a tank designed to fight in the streets. I'm not even going on that. But what happens is the fighting gets so overwhelming that they decide at in the middle of the night, you know what? We're leaving. We're leaving. So they go, they take all the gold they can find. And in the middle of the, uh, like midnight, one o'clock in the morning, they make this long column. And they take this column and they're going to march down uh, in the middle of the night when no one's out, dead asleep. They're going to sneak out of the city, take all the gold and say, you know what? We're just gonna have to ban abandon this this uh this project or this this uh, military objective. We can't hold it. So they do this, and this is called this is on June thirtieth, fifteen twenty, La Noche Trista. Okay, it's the uh, I think it's called the the uh, Night of Sorrow, Night of Sorrows. This is the escape, and what happens is uh, the Span again the Spaniards and their uh, Tlaxcalan uh, allied forces they get on this causeway, several thousand of them, and they march out in dead silence. And Cortez is in the middle of this long column. And all the gold, all the valuables, they're all in the back of a column. The lead forces have the cavalry, have the real strong forces, and they're marching silently. No one's talking. You just hear the crickets at night. You know, th there's the moons out. You can see the reflection of the waters. Remember, just the causeway surround both sides of the waters. They're marching. And by the time halfway through the column, reaches the end of the causeway there's a aztec woman she's out there fishing and she sees them and she starts screaming they're getting away they're getting away and the whole city gets up 
lights flame uh, you, uh not lights uh you can see the torches they all uh, uh the light of the torches reflect in the building and you see them marching uh the aztecs jump in their canoes and surround the causeway and they ambush they ambush uh, the the Spaniards and their allies, and it's a massacre. The last third of that of that um, uh, column just they're they're cut off. They're killed. They run back in the city. All the gold and the horses, uh, not all, most of the gold, some of the horses and the mules uh, they were using fall into the water and drown. It's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. And Cortez and, and he's safe. He gets the majority of his forces. He gets them out of there with some of the allies, and they're on the retreat, people. He is like, oh, my God. We've lost most of our gold. It's a complete disaster. His top lieutenant survived, but some of some of them uh, uh, were left back, and only God knows what happened to them. And according to some sources, some of the Spaniards and their allies didn't even know that the column was marching. They were asleep, only to learn uh, that uh, to hear the ruckus outside when there were forces were being attacked. So God knows what happened to those people. So this is the the Spanish, the mighty Spanish force, which has been in this major city, getting ready to take this potential new Spain, this whole area, you know, the, this capital that represents this whole culture is now in retreat. The Spanish forces are wounded. They're tired. They're exhausted. And what happens is they're marching back to the east. They have to go back to at least one of their uh, 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 Indian allies, the Flex Colin, going back to them at least to re rest and recuperate. Because right now, as they're moving, they're being ambushed every mile along the way. It's just horrific. And this people goes to one of the most fascinating battles called the Battle of Antumba. This is 9th to 10th July of 1520. So imagine, if you will, there's 800 Spaniards. Remember, this is the this is the total um, uh, of Navarov's for uh, Navarov's force and Cortes. Ha they're probably 50 percent 50 combat strength. They're exhausted. They're tired. They have several thousand uh, Indian allies. They're tired. They're exhausted. They've been beaten up. They've they've lost uh, supplies. They've lost friends. I mean, look, these guys. This is the beaten force. Cortes is is, is his column is marching, and as they march into this big open plains, they see in front of them on the horizon, and it looks like giant bricks, bricks on the ground going uh, east to west, this big brown formation, and on top are all these little colors. People, it's probably 20,000 Aztecs, and they are out there to do, decisively destroy the uh, conquistadors they know they have them on the run and it, uh, it was the aztec for the aztecs who put this force together and the goal is to trap them or at least ambush them and fight fight them and kill them get rid of them get rid of this force so right now cortez with 800 spanish probably half of them remember many of these are wounded with his wounded forces are now faced with a force that's probably 10 to 1 against them so so what happens? Now, this is fascinating. Again, another fascinating aspect of history. The Aztecs are going to fight them in open battle, open fields, okay? Now, people, I'm not exaggerating. Cortez and his force at the 800, 17 horsemen. Not 70, one seven, 17 horsemen in armor. They are ready for battle. Everyone arrays for battle, and Cortez knows how to use this cavalry. And boy, do they. The battle ensues. Remember, the Spanish have their armor. They have their crossbows. They have some ammunition left. They lost a lot. But the cavalry goes out there and, and they charge into the, the Aztec ranks. Now, this is important. Like, like anything in military history, you know, you always have a commander. You have a leader. Well, how do you see them? Imagine being on the field with a thousand people. How the hell do you know where you're at? Well, you look for the flags, the guidons, like we have in the military today. There's a flag. So, you know, it might say H. That's hotel. That's my company. It's my unit. Well, the same thing with the Aztecs. Their leaders have these huge plumes. They, they stick out. You can't miss them. And that leader represents a unit. So what does Cortez do? What has he been doing previously? Goes for the jugular. He, he tells the horsemen, charge. Charge into the leaders. Kill the leaders and knock their plumes off. 
And so what they do, and the and this uh, in fact, I, I'm going to read a section from this book, uh, Conquest, to you. This is just amazing. It's amazing. Okay, so this is page 425 in Conquest by Hugh Thomas. Here we go. Here we go. And this is the Battle of Antumba. Here we go. <clears throat> Cortez tells us, remember, his cowardmen to kill the leaders. Uh, and don't ask me how to pronounce this. It's a lot of these names are, uh, I'm going to say the, uh, the ground leaders. The ground leader was knocked on the ground by Cortez, which Juan Salamanca, one of his guys, killed him with his lance, sweeping up his fine commander's plumes and standard for the benefit of Cortez, who, however, tossed these trophies back to Salamanca, again, his lieutenant. It was the loss of the standard as much as, or even more than, the loss of the leader, which counted adversely for the Mexica. This was partly due to the psychological effect, but the Mexican standard, mounted tightly on the back of the leader on a bamboo frame, also indicated to the army where it was going. Its disappearance spelled confusion. Now I'm continuing here. Cortez's own mount, that's his horse, uh, Cortez's own mount on this adventure was said to have been an untrained cart horse. The great lady of Cortez's army, uh, Maria Estrada of Seville, once again fought in this battle with a lance in her hand as if she was one of the most experienced soldiers in the world. That's one of his female soldiers. Bernal Diaz, this is an author uh, who's written about Cortez. Bernal Diaz gave credit to the dogs. Spanish have dogs with them, people. With what fury the dogs fought. He, comment, he commented, so showing that many of them had escaped the disaster of the Noche Triste. The Mexica lost this engagement since they were badly organized. They were incapable of dealing with an attack in open country by mountain men, however weary. Now, this is the most fascinating uh, paragraph here. The Mexican force, it continues, the Mexican force retired in disorder at a moment when they were not far short from their second triumph over the Castilians. That's the uh, Spanish. Otumba, the Battle of Otumba, is always deservedly held to rank among the most famous battle honors of Cortes. It is a word which decorates his statue in the main square of Medellin. There should also be a statue there to the horse of Castile, for if ever that animal turned the day in a battle, it was on this occasion. So the genius again of Cortes fighting is he goes to the juggler, he fights the leaders, he decapitates, and doing so he causes chaos, he causes massive disorder. And for these forces, for the forces of the Aztecs, as you'll hear with Dr. Vallejos and I, the, they're highly structured. It is a very, very deliberate, structured organization. They follow orders. You're probably not going to see the kind of decentralized leadership that, that it really is characterized by Western armies. You know, if you cut off a squad or you cut off a couple of guys of, of the Castiles, of, of the conquistadors, they'll fight their way back to the leader. They know what to do. They have, they understand his intent, but not with this, uh, this, uh, this really highly structured religious uh, people of the Aztecs. So, the battle of, uh, by the way, uh, the casualties, I, I've read up to 10,000, 10,000 Aztec casualties. Incredible. It's like 50% of their army. And you might ask how that happens. Well, the fact is a lot of these casualties happen uh, even back in the old days, in the ancient battles. They happen when one army is routed. They run away and the other army is just running behind them, spearing them in the back. And that's what you read here. A lot of these uh, horses the, with their lances, guys, when you see the old knights, you know, when they do the jousting, that lance is going into your eye socket. It's going through your skull, and it's going to pin you um, like a shish kebab. It's pretty disgusting, but that's how they fight. So 17 horsemen, 800 Spaniards, and roughly maybe 1,000 to 2,000 uh, other Spanish allies or the uh, Indian allies against 20,000 Aztecs. And it is a, it is a victory for uh, Cortez, even at half strength. So people, this is such a great example of what you might call a competitive advantage. If you have the advantage in power and shock power and armor, and you attack that force, even no matter how weak they are, you attack them in their arena, boy, they're going to get the best of you. So that right there, that right there is, that really ends the defending the goal. I think I said phase three, there's really phase four. Retaking the goal. And long story short is this. Long story short is, Cortez goes back to, uh, they recuperate, and he gets more, more supplies from Cuba, more Cuban uh, uh, 
more things from the arsenals, more soldiers, more weapons. He gets uh, he reinforces his political relationship with his Indian allies, and they come back with a vengeance. And boy, Cortez is already known for terror and psychological effect. Well, he does it more, showing them there's there's two ways. It's either my way or, or you're going into the ground. And, they, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, Aztec allies e either stop fighting or stop supporting the Aztecs or they even go with Cortez. So what ultimately what happens is Cortez comes back with a renewed force, renewed allied force, and they slowly work their way back to, Nish to, to Nishtilin. They surround it. They isolate it. They kill off ally by ally, getting their, uh, either killing them off or getting them to ally with the, um, with the Spaniards. And they they ultimately surround the capital, and this is where uh, they surround the capital from the west. Uh, excuse me, from the west, north, and south, and on the eastern part, which is surrounded all by water. Cortez has one of his guys build brigantines, and these are boats that long boats that can fit what I think forty men, thirty to forty men, and he puts cannons on them. And what happens is they literally it's like a boa constrictor. The Spanish they surround the city. They, they rob it of its uh, of its satellites of its allies and constrict it. And by this time, by the, uh, by fifteen twenty one, you gotta realize the Aztecs are losing their allies. Um, disease disease actually hits um, the 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 uh, smallpox. I should say smallpox hits in December of fifteen twenty, and it hits the Aztecs. It hits some of the. It hits the Spanish. It hits the Spanish allies. This came from the Spanish, uh, but it actually affects everyone, but not really the Spanish because uh, even though some are affected, uh, it really affects their allies and the Aztecs, and it weakens them. That, that's the point. It just weakens them. But the city's still there. They have this major metropolis that the Spanish have to uh, conquer. So ultimately, they surround the city. Uh, from the north, south, and the west with land forces, they then take their navy, which they build, built by scratch. And I think there was, I think it was an example of like six mile long, uh, there's six miles of people taking this wood and these barges inland to, to the one of the five major lakes that surround Tenochtitlan. They take it, they rebuild them on the shoreline, and they they take these boats and, they, and then they go to the eastern side of the city. In doing so, they destroy, they kill the other Aztecs and their, their canoes, really just constricting them. But this is not it, people. Just because you surround the city doesn't mean it's over with. They surround the city. And what happened in 1521 is urban combat. You People, uh, Cortez, his, his lieutenants, their Spanish allies are fighting block by block. It is ugly. Now, I said to you earlier in the Battle of Otumba, if you re recall, remember the Spanish, especially with their cavalry and their muskets, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, some of their firepower and in the crossbows, out in the open, that, that's where they flourish. That's their real competitive advantage. But now they're in a city. They're in closed quarter combat. In the military, you call it MOUT, M-O-U-T, Military Operations in Urban Terrain. And what happens is the Aztecs are fighting building by building. They're on top of the roofs, throwing huge slabs of uh, of rock on top of the uh, on top of the uh, Spanish. They're and the Spanish are taking casualties. It is a slow, methodical uh, uh, attack. And and what happens is they bring the brigantines. They bring them through. They bring them down those little um, like you know the Venice causeways the, or the, along the causeways. Uh, through the city and, and supported by infantry. So they attack building by building. But there's one event that happens that really is, I think it's the event that really piqued my interest. And I'm going to read it to you. Uh, I don't know what day this is. It's sometime between uh, July and August, uh, 1521. And something happens with Cortez that it is, uh, I, I, I'm going to describe it to you generally, then I'm going to give you a reading of what happens. And just to show you the, ferocity of the fighting and i would tell you just the i don't know the terror the absolute terror of fighting if you're a conquistador fighting this alien absolute alien culture the aztecs as cortez and his uh group are fighting they have a major offensive they're going from the south to the north into the city they're probably uh they're they're, they're deep inside the city now 
And there's really basically in essence, there's three prongs going, you know, going up three roads, th three roads. And I, I mentioned before, they're using the brigantine ships. The brigantine ships would actually be on next to a causeway. It'd be on the, on, on the little water channel in the city and they would bring their cannons on there. Uh, they would use the cannons to support the infantry. So if you're infantry fighting and you got the, you got the brigantine right behind you, they'll shoot over your head or around or, you know, to, to your flank and blast your enemy with can with cannon rounds, which gives your force a major, major uh, advantage, right? Well, anyway, one of the things that happens is every night, well, every day, the Spanish, uh, actually, let me back up. Well, every day, as, as the fighting continues, the Aztecs come and they cut holes or they, they blatten that blast, but they, they create huge gaps along the causeway. I mean, you know, you can't bring your horses over. You'd actually have to go into a little a ditch to get over it. So they're actually creating enormous holes in these, in these causeways. And every day, the conquistadors and their Indian allies have to fill them. They got to fill them up. And if you fill them up, that means your horses and your infantry can continually move uh, unfettered. Uh, you know, th there's no loss of momentum. Well, one day they're fighting this major offense that the Spanish, uh, as they penetrate further in the city, the Aztecs get behind them and create us huge goals in the causeway. And, and, the, and these holes are so big that it actually traps, it traps one of the forces uh, in the city. And that one of those forces ha happens to be uh, Cortez himself. He's in there. So Cortez and his people are fighting and uh, they get trapped that they're, they're the, remember, this is street to street fighting. So there's just swarms, swarms of Aztec soldiers coming. Remember, you're in that you're in there, you're on their home turf. There's swarms of them coming, fighting. And the the Spanish are trying to back up some, trying to get some more space. And guess what? You can't back up. If you do, you're gonna fall off into the water. And, and then you're really screwed. So what happens is one of these forces, it gets it, they get in such uh, peril condition that it's reported that even uh uh, they, they basically get trapped. Cortez has about five to six uh, Aztec chieftains grabbing him, grabbing him, trying to take him prisoner so he can cut his heart out. And one of his uh, 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 Cortez lieutenants comes up, saves him at the last moment, comes up with a sword and reports about how he chops the hands off of the Aztecs that are on Cortez. Anyway, Cortez is saved, but that happens again to the other prong. And that prong, that that force of of uh, Spanish, I think around fifty, they're captured. They're captured with several of their Indian allies. And how do they learn about this? Well, two things happen. One is uh, probably about thirty minutes later, after they're captured, as Cortez is fighting, it's reported that the Aztecs opposite, you know, opposite the street, they're taunting him, and he starts throwing these bearded heads at the Spanish. It's their friends. They, they've been decapitated, had their heads cut off, and there's just bloody, disgusting faces with their tongues hanging out with wet beards with chunks of skin on there. Yeah, that's their friends. So that's one. That's one uh, element that they know that they've been captured. But this is the one I want to read to you. This comes from page 512 of Conquest. Now, I just told you about how the, the Mexica threw those heads out. Quote, as the Mexica shouted these threats, the Castilians heard in the distance the sonorous sounds of drums, trumpets, and horns, indicating that some prisoners were about to be sacrificed. The drums and trumpets were so loud as to suggest once more that the world was coming to an end, as Cortes put it, using an expression of which he was fond. Alvarado, Sandoval, Lujo, Tapia, those are his lieutenants, as well as the commanders of the brigantines in the lake, all saw in the distance from the Tacuba Causeway that, quote, our comrades were being carried by force up the steps of the great temple, end quote, Tlatlaco. They were, of course, naked. When they got them up to the little square in the front of the shrine of the gods, wrote Bernal Diaz in a famous passage, we saw them, this is Spanish talking, we saw them place pl plumes on their heads and with things like fans, they forced them to dance before their god, their blood god. Then they placed them on their backs on some stones and 
with large flint knives. They sawed open, sawed open their chests and drew out their palpitating hearts and offered them to the gods. They kicked the bodies down the steps and Indian butchers who were waiting below cut off the arms and the legs and flayed the faces and prepared them afterwards as kind of glove leather with the beards still on for use in drunken fiestas while the bodies were eaten with mole and their stomachs and guts they threw to the tigers lions and snakes which were kept in the wild animals zoo the ceremony of sacrifice was of course designed to be seen from afar in the greco-roman tradition spectators looked down at the stage in old mexico the public was intended to look up i'm continuing here the Florentine Codex, this is what really describes what happened uh, during, this is really the history written uh, during, the, during this time. The Florentine Codex described how, on this horrifying occasion for the Castilians, some captives wept, some sang, and one went crying out while striking his mouth with the palm of his hand. Then they reached Kahutomek's headquarters, that's the new emperor, Kahutomek, they were made to stand in rows. That's the Spanish. They were made to stand in rows. One by one, the multitude went to the pyramid where they were sacrificed. The Spaniards went first, then the allies. They strung up the heads of the Spaniards on the skull rack. They also strung up the heads of four horses. One thing I do want to add to this is Traditionally, to my understanding, these sacrifices, when they made these sacrifices, especially to, you know, the Indian uh, Aztec allies, you're, in, you're usually given some kind of psychedelic drug, uh, uh, probably to alleviate the fear, the pain to do something. That is not, it is not confirmed at all that happened to the Spaniards. Pretty much, they were probably treated at like the lowest level. They were brought up there. They were held. Uh, they were brought to a stone. Their, their arms and legs were held by major force, probably by several people where the priest came up with a knife and then cut the man's heart out. Sliced the skin, reached under the rib cage, and the man, maybe they're screaming, maybe they're passed out in fear, and pulled out the heart. Horrible. Now imagine being a Westerner and seeing that of your friends, people you knew, people who you fought with. And in fact, one of Cortez's uh, close comrades that happened to him. So I don't know, people. <laughs> I don't know. What would you do? So uh, to end this, to end this, the fighting continues. The fighting continues, and ultimately the Spaniards move in uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, and they, they, they slowly kill and tire out the Aztecs. And, and if you can remember, the Aztecs are isolated. They are cut off. They had some supplies of food, uh, of, of you know, things to resources, sources to live on, but that, that was being eaten away by the huge population. So ultimately... We can say by 1521, the Aztecs in August surrender. They surrender and they capture the new emperor, Kahutamak. Kahutamak. I'm totally killing this name. So so I'm sure some listeners are totally laughing at me. All right. Uh, and you can imagine after the surrender, the uh, Indian allies of the, of the Spaniards, guess what they go do? They go and ransack the whole place. They ransack, kill, rape, murder. Uh, they do it all. And I want you just to rem remember this. What was the original goal of Cortes? To take this beautiful goal, this, this goal, this city, the city of, uh, they call it the New Venice, with this beautiful people and its population and the commerce and all the art, the exquisite paintings, the pictures, everything, to take it whole and give it to their king. Look at our beautiful prize we've given you, king. Now, that went from taking this city of, of uh, with a people who, Okay, we'll take, you know, take a new leader to that uprising where the people in the populace are not so happy now to a ruined, smoldered city. It's smoldering. It's burning. It's basically wrecked and destroyed. It, the city will have to be rebuilt. And one of the things that would just, I think probably one of the biggest ironies of this story is Cortez takes it. He takes uh, the city. And uh, I think what's... <laughs> 
a lot of their, a lot of their Aztec, a lot of the Indian allies, those who you know were once uh, satellites to the Mexican, were like, "Hey, we're going to use these Spaniards to do our work for us to take over Tenochtitlan. They will take over Tenochtitlan." Well, guess what? They all lose because uh, basically the Spaniards come in and then they retake the city. Obviously, they help rebuild it, and really the Spaniards start running it. But probably the greatest irony of this, I think the greatest irony of this is Cortez. When you read about Cortez, and again, I, I have some ideas of who he was behaviorally just reading this. But again, you, again, you're reading accounts, private people who either hated him or didn't like him. So I don't know. But I think some of his tactics, you can detect maybe some aspects to him. One of the things is you could tell that he was really, really big about having being recognized he wanted to be really the king's second you know almost like a second in command the power behind the throne to be the hero of the king to have the king say hey here's my man Cortes. look at look at this you know look what he's done for spain well when he takes to Nechtitlan, and again and there, there's more things to happen after this but th this is really this is the heart this is the decisive victory this this is this is what settles everything the aztec uh you know this this culture this uh, of 25 million people really it, it starts to change there's huge spanish influence it really is under spanish at least spanish control via could be via through you know their new satellites of the spanish allies but this huge kingdom this new spain which they call this new spain has been taken it's been conquered and spain itself the king it, they're too preoccupied there are so many things happening they're like okay great it, it almost falls off the radar it's not the huge victory uh, that that, uh, uh, that Cortez expects. I mean, he gets some victory parades. He gets, you know, not, uh, he gets the uh, the welcoming, the celebrations, but it's not long lasting. It's not, it, you know, he literally discovered a new world, conquered a new world with a tiny force that, you know, in a sense, was almost like a private uh, enterprise. He paid, he paid for a lot of himself. Uh, he gets sued several years later, and that's a whole new. It's a part of the story you got to read. But if you like this, if you like the story uh, about this tiny force uh, who comes in and, and fights an alien force, and uh, both sides have, are extremely sophisticated, they both have great elements, aspects to them, both sides are incredibly brutal, uh, that's just a way of life, and the Aztecs lost, and the Spanish won. So with that, I have, with that, I hope you enjoyed this story. And now, and now you can listen to Dr. Vallejos and I actually discuss this for, I think, an hour and 20 minutes. With that, I hope you enjoy this. Check out the book Conquest by Hugh Thomas. Again, I read it in seven days. I could not put it down. Could not put it down. And it's an extraordinary scholarly work. With that, people, I hope you have a great day and uh, enjoy the rest of this podcast. Thanks for watching. If you like this content and want to see more of it, please subscribe. If you want to learn more about chaos and how it deals with leadership, then sign up for early access and new information about my upcoming book, Strength in Chaos, A Leader's Guide to Mastering the Uncontrollable. Check it out on thechaosbook.com. See you later.